Well, hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Field Transmissions. My name is Aaron Provencio. I'm a member of the team here at Galapagos Conservancy, and I will introduce our two incredible guests in just a second. But first, I want to wish everyone a very happy World Penguin Day. I know this is the day that is very close to the hearts of the two guests that we have here today, and I'm sure a lot of you at home are very excited to help us celebrate with these two one of, you know, the most exciting days of the year with some of the most exciting, incredible, unique creatures that call Galapagos home. But before we get to all that and before I give these two a chance to introduce themselves and, and introduce you to their world and their area of study, um, we have a little bit of, of um, housekeeping to go through. So if at any point during this talk you have any questions or uh, concerns or comments, please feel free to note those, to comment those in the bottom um, in the comment section below where our wonderful moderator will go through and answer what they can. And then if there are any really good questions that we can't answer on our own, we will actually pass those along to me and I in turn will pass those along to our two guests. And if we have time at the end of our talk, they will answer those for you, which is very exciting because they are the world experts on this topic. Now, of course, um, if at any point today during the discussion you are inspired to make a donation, please feel free to visit Galapagos.org to learn more about our work with penguins and other species of wildlife across Galapagos as well as our sustainable society work and make a donation there if you would like. Um, but of course, please sit back and enjoy our talk with these incredible guests as part of World Penguin Day. So without further ado, would the two of you like to introduce yourselves to our viewers at home? I'm Dee Borsma, and um, I'm very grateful to the Galapagos Conservancy because they have supported our work on Galapagos penguins. And most people don't even know that there are penguins in the Galapagos. So this is an important educational moment on World Penguin Day, because they get, penguins get all the way to the equator. Hi, I'm Caroline Capello. I'm a PhD student in the biology department and at the Center for Ecosystem Sentinels at the University of Washington. Um, and Dee is my PhD advisor. And I have been a wildlife ecologist working with birds and mammals for the last 10 years. Um, but starting in 2014, I started working with Magellanic penguins in Argentina with Dee. And the following year I started working, I, I additionally started working with her um, on the Galapagos Penguin Project. So since 2015, I've been traveling to Galapagos with Dee uh, two times a year to study the penguins, their breeding behavior, their ecology, and their population dynamics. And I'm super happy to be here today. Thank you for having us. Well, we are super happy to have both of you. This is something that has been well overdue in terms of field transmissions. I know I've been looking forward to ch chatting with the two of you about this subject for the entire run of this program. Now, Dr. Borsma, I'm wondering if we could take a second to kind of go back and let the folks at home know just how long have you been working with Galapagos penguins? It's been a few years now. Aaron, longer than you've been alive. <laughs> I've been going to the Galapagos since 1970, so <laughs> more than 50 years um, studying Galapagos penguins. I started out as a PhD student like Caroline, but at Ohio State University, and I just fell in love with penguins. And so I've spent <laughs> my entire academic career working on either Galapagos penguins or Magellanic penguins or some combination of penguins. There's 18 species of penguins, so I've got more to do. And as you kind of mentioned earlier, and I think that, you know, for the sake of, of myself learning, and then of course those folks at home, you kind of mentioned that people might not necessarily associate penguins with Galapagos, much less the tropics in the first place, more often than not. And I know I'm speaking for myself here, but you think of the frozen tundras and the icebergs and the cold, cold waters of, of the, the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, kind of way down near the poles. But all of a sudden, we have these penguins that are in Galapagos and have been there for quite a while. So I'm wondering if the two of you can shed a little bit of light on just how they got there in the first place. Yeah, well, I think you you something you mentioned is really uh, a critical point to penguins being in Galapagos is that you associate penguins with ice, snow, but with cold water. 
And that's something that Galapagos does have. You know, it's not, it is on the equator, but it isn't just surrounded by these hot tropical um, sort of nutrient poor waters. It has these cold water currents that move into the islands and enable marine life to really thrive there, enable food to persist there. Um, and so the penguins probably came out, we don't know exactly when, but probably about a million years ago, they, a group of penguins, some amount of penguins was carried out to the islands or came out to the islands from uh, the Peruvian coast on the Humboldt current. Um, their most closely related relative is the Humboldt penguin, which uh, breeds and migrates along the coasts of Peru and Chile. Um, and then there are also Magellanic penguins in Chile and in Argentina. And so we do have penguins on the South American continent and some group of them came out to Galapagos maybe about a million years ago and have slowly adapted and evolved to be um, very, very well adapted to uh, the Galapagos climate. So the thing that is important for everybody to recognize is that there's really only two species of penguins that live really in cold places. The emperor penguin, which is the biggest of the penguins, and then the one that you see on public television all the time, the Adelie penguin. Um, those are Antarctic penguins, but Galapagos penguins, along with many other species of penguins, um, are really sub-Antarctic, and the Galapagos penguins are, are the ones that are the furthest north. They're the only ones that briefly get into the northern hemisphere to breed. Most of even the Galapagos penguins are breeding in the southern hemisphere, but there's a few that just cross the um, equator uh, and the northern part of Isabella and breed up there. So they're well adapted to the Galapagos Islands and they're found not on just one island in the Galapagos, but several islands. And because of the Galapagos Conservancy in part, we hope that there's gonna be a larger colony breeding on Floriana. The penguins have been just barely able to hold on to Floriana. They're breeding on these little offshore islets and in on very uh, steep uh, parts of Floriana where it would be hard for the cats and rats to get to them. But once they remove cats, rats, dogs from Floriana, it should be a much more hospitable place for Galapagos penguins. And we need to have more places for Galapagos penguins, particularly on World Penguin Day. So we hope that we'll be able to celebrate an expansion of the Galapagos penguin population to other islands soon. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure there's, you know, many people at home who are watching this who agree wholeheartedly with the need to, to help support these, these incredible little seabirds, really. And so my, my next question, you kind of touched on it, is the, is the breeding and the, but could you give us a little bit more information on, on the life history of these penguins, sort of where do they live, what do they eat, how and where do they produce kind of the basics of, of penguin, Galapagos penguin biology? You want to do that, Caroline? Sure. So, so yeah, so Galapagos penguins, they are um, residents and endemic to Galapagos. So they only live in Galapagos and they don't leave Galapagos. So they're not migratory in the sense that a lot of other animals and, and penguins are. Um, and they... They lay two eggs, one, two, or as many as three times a year um, in underground or so to lay their eggs, they need to protect it from the hot equatorial sun and also from predators. So they tend to nest or lay their eggs in crevices in the lava, lava tunnels, lava caves, basically anywhere that's a really shady spot is can be a, a good spot for them to lay their eggs. Um, and as a result, they're not these dense colony nesters. Like you think of a lot of seabirds, just, you know, 100,000 seabirds all sitting out on their eggs um, on this, you know, snowy plain, or um, they're, they're sort of spread out across um, mostly the Western side of Galapagos um, and breed there and forage there, eating mostly small fish, they'll eat sardines, silver sides, um, Anchovies. Anchovies. And what's what's really, I think, pretty distinct about them compared to other penguins is that they, they don't have a strong seasonality to their breeding. They've been seen breeding in every month of the year. They've been seen molting in every month of the year. Um, and that's because the the climate in Galapagos can be so unpredictable and so dynamic that these birds have really 
um, developed a very, uh, the ability to breed opportunistically. When conditions are good, they'll breed. When conditions are not good, they'll hold off and wait to breed and wait to molt. So they have a really sort of um, flexible um, and dynamic sort of yearly schedule for breeding and molting. That's super, super interesting. It's it's so, um, I mean, I guess you all could tell me this more than I could say it myself, but I'm sure that's very unique in terms of, of bird species and kind of penguin species even more often than to have that kind of ad adaptation. And really, I mean, Galapagos, the story of so many species that are in Galapagos is that adaptability and the, the, the willingness and the ability to, to adapt, to thrive and survive in some really extreme conditions. Mm -hmm. now, well, that's the value of natural selection because natural selection, as we all know, part of its home is really in the Galapagos with Charles Darwin. But these penguins are a really good example of selection favoring different sorts of natural histories mm. than for other species of penguins. And if you're interested in seeing more about Galapagos penguins, if you go to our, our website called ecosystemsentinels.org and click on videos, you'll see a lot of videos of Galapagos <laughs> penguins because when we, when Carol and I go down there, we take a lot of videos of penguins because that's what we're interested in. And then my students have made those into videos, uh, educational vi videos. So there are lots of videos on Galapagos penguins me and Magellanic penguins and yellow-eyed penguins too um, on our website. Yeah, and again, that is ecosystemsentinels.org. Hopefully our moderator will be able to put that in the comments below. I know that I have used that as a resource for a lot of my work, and so if you have any interest in learning more outside of and after this talk, please feel free to visit ecosystemsentinels.org to learn more. Now, Dr. Borsma, Caroline, as you both mentioned, you make consistent biannual trips down to the Galapagos Archipelago to check in on the penguin populations down there. And so much of your work over the last few years and decades has been understanding penguin population trends, the health and size of the populations in the archipelago. And I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of information about just what you've learned over the years. Let me just start that out and then I'll turn it over to Caroline. But one of the things that everybody wants to know is how many penguins are there? Now there's certain questions that really don't deserve answers. How many people are there in the world? It's changing all the time, right? There's births all the time, there's deaths all the time. We don't really know how many people there are in the world. We know that it's almost 8 billion now, but we don't know exactly. And the same thing's true for Galapagos penguins. It's impossible, I would argue, to ever know how many Galapagos penguins there are without just an incredible amount of work, but the reason it, they're so difficult, it's not like counting emperor penguins or daily penguins where we can look at satellites and wherever the emperor penguins or daily penguins have pooped because they eat so much krill, it gets orange and you can see where the colonies are. You can't see where the colonies are um, in Galapagos. Mostly the penguins are breeding um, separate from other penguins. And so that there's usually a lot of space around them where there are no penguins. So it's really a problem. The other thing is Carolyn has already mentioned is they're in these fissures or crevices or lava tubes. So are they out there? No, they're not out there. They're in the shade because if they were out in the sun, they'd get too hot and you'd see them panting. And we have a lot of videos of Galapagos penguins standing right next to the edge of the sea and they're panting like crazy because they don't have any sweat glands. So the only way they can keep cool is by panting like a dog pants. And they can then evaporate water off of their uh, dogs, off their tongue, uh, penguins off of their tongues as well. And so they can get cool that way by taking in air and then, exp and then expelling the air out. So penguins don't want to be in the heat. And if they get hot, they jump in the water. And they can cool off immediately. But because they're hidden when they're having eggs or chicks, you can't see them. So how many penguins are there? If you can't see them, it's really difficult to count them. And when we have gone around and counted them, they're standing out in the open. But how many are not out in the open? We don't know. So knowing how many Galapagos penguins there are, 
I've spent now more than 50 years of my life trying to figure it out. I don't think it's an answerable question. We can ask whether there's more or less, and that's why it's so important um, for us to go to the Galapagos twice a year to try to see what the penguins are doing. And the only way we've been able to do that is because of Galapagos Conservancy helping buy our tickets, getting field time on boats so we can go and travel and see who's using our nests and how well they're doing. So I don't think we can really answer how many penguins there are, but we can tell you whether they're doing well or whether they're doing poorly by, by whether they're breeding or whether there's juveniles in the population. More than you wanted to know. <laughs> That's exactly what we wanted to know. Caroline, I was curious if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I mean, as as Dee was was articulating, it, it is very challenging to study these penguins um, if for all the reasons she just said, and in, and additionally because because they have that super flexible breeding schedule, it's hard to know when to even plan a field trip. You know, when should we go to maximize the number of breeding penguins that we're going to see, or maximize the number of penguins we'll be able to count, or um, you know, when when do you time those trips? And so we that's why that's another reason why we've sort of set it two times a year to try to capture um, the sort of hot and rainy season and one trip during the cool Garua season. Um, and really on those trips, we're trying to gain a really holistic view of what's going on. So we are checking nests to see if they are breeding. Um, we are catching penguins and measuring them and weighing them to get a sense of their body condition. So are they really fat and healthy? Uh, seeming, or are they skinny and seeming like they're struggling to find food? Are they covered in algae, which means they're spending all their time in the water looking for food? They're not spending any time out on land sort of drying off and cleaning their feathers. Um, we also look to see what the other seabirds are doing. So we'll, we will count the blue-footed boobies and make notes if we find pelican nests or cormorant nests as we're doing our penguin surveys. And all of that together, including sort of water, we have a, a sea temperature loggers out that we get data off of each time we go. So all these things, we sort of try to try to synthesize them together to get a holistic view of um, sort of, yeah, how the, the population is doing and are they likely to be increasing or decreasing. And a lot of those questions do take years to see. So just now, now that we've been doing these two trips a year consistently since 2010, now we're starting to feel like we may have enough data to start building those models or start start actually getting at that question of, of is what is the population trend or, or what are um, sort of these um, vital rates of these birds. Well, what an, what an exciting time to be in, in terms of research. I mean, to have put so much time and energy into it and be kind of be finally getting to the point where you feel maybe you can start to understand these trends a little bit better. And I'm curious because you spoke a little bit about resources and one of the, one of the pictures that you sent, Caroline, was this little boat that you had a nickname for. And I think we have a picture of it, but do you want to talk about a little bit about your research vessel? Yeah, is that the Ratty? Is that the, yes. So that is our that is our home away from home, our beloved Ratty. It is a, a research boat owned by our collaborator in Galapagos named Godfrey Merlin. He is a captain, boat captain, boat engineer, and just tremendous conservationist. Um, he has contributed so much to the Galapagos Islands over the years. Um, and has been really influential in the conservation of the islands. And we have the, and he and Godfrey, or Godfrey and Dee have been friends since 1970. And so uh, it's just an absolute privilege to be able to fly down to the islands and go out on this boat with Godfrey. I believe it's named Ratty from a children, a British children's book. That's a character from a British children's book that he uh, liked. And so, yeah, we'll live aboard this boat for, 12 to 14 days, um, sleeping and eating aboard the boat, and then um, taking a little dinghy to do our surveys where we'll cruise slowly up and down the coast, looking for penguins, looking for nests. Um, when we see a penguin, we try to capture it. Um, when we find a nest, we, we check to see if it has chicks or eggs or signs that they've been using it recently. Um, but yeah, life on Ratty is, is, is pretty awesome. <laughs> And it's not a luxury boat by any um, stretch of the imaginations. In fact, uh, one of the things that has been challenging 
is that we have uh, four bunks and five people. So uh, usually Caroline and myself and Godfrey uh, sleep outside on the deck. The only problem is during the rainy season, which is usually in February when we're down checking nests, it can pour. And so then everybody wants to be inside and we do get everybody inside, but it's uh, really close quarters to say the least. And we've been kind of worried about COVID and stuff because going down there has uh, been a challenge. Um, and fortunately, none of us have gotten COVID and we've managed these uh, um, 12 day field trips in both the summer season and, and their Garua season, which is the cold season. But it's really different um, depending on whether you get rain or not. Now, one of the other things people probably don't think about is all species of penguins live pretty much in deserts. Penguins don't like to get wet, particularly their chicks. If the chicks get wet, all that down, if you have a down coat and you ever stood out in the rain, you realize suddenly the down coat's no good. You just get really cold. And penguins, that's, that's the same problem. So they have to live in desert environments. So like a daily penguins, you can see their chicks sometimes with ice on the top of their down. They're so well insulated that it, they, they don't get wet, but they don't get rain. Now that's one of the problems. We're getting more rain on snow events in the Antarctic and that does affect penguin chicks. So in the Galapagos, it's not a problem for chicks because again, as I told you, they're in crevices or in lava tubes or lava tunnels. So it, it, even when it's raining, they're not gonna get their chicks wet but they all, all penguins like to live in deserts because they don't want to get their chick down wet. And that is a perfect segue to my next question. And you've been kind of speaking about it and mentioning, you know, the, the, the crevices, the lava tubes, these are essential for, for the penguins themselves to hide from the intense weather, the intense heat. I know, as I was mentioning earlier, I just got back from a couple of weeks in Galapagos working down there, and I experienced the heat and the intense sun first person. I, I got pretty, pretty badly sunburned, and so I could imagine that the animals that live down there have better adaptations than I do. And I'm wondering, because so much of the work that you have done in the, in the past years and in in past decades has been, you know, understanding their nesting habits, but also constructing nests themselves. And so I'm curious as to why, why was human intervention needed and human construction of these nests necessary, especially recently? Well, let me just start by saying, you know, I, I first went down to the Galapagos in 1970 to study Galapagos penguins, and I did my dissertation on Galapagos penguins. But one of the things that I saw stuck with me years, more than 50 years later, and that was these, this pair of penguins that laid their eggs on the bare lava. They didn't have any shade. They were close to the water, probably um, about uh, five meters uh, above the water line. But they laid their eggs out in the open. And by about 9.30 or 10 o'clock every day, whoever was on the eggs was panting. And they left. And then at about 4 o'clock or 4.30, they'd come back and sit on the eggs. Needless to say, after a few days, those eggs are fried. And they will never hatch. So it kills the eggs. So um, that certainly stuck with me. And I thought, geez, you know, I mean, they, they must have trouble finding nest sites. And of course, I had trouble finding nest sites. And Carolyn can attest that we, we've, this one pair of penguins we know um, nests way up high, like 20 meters off of the, um, from the high tide line. But they're in, a, bu a bunch of jumble of lava rocks. And so to get for her to, for Caroline to catch that bird or me to catch that bird, we have to take apart the nest. Then we can get the penguin out. Then we have to put the penguin back in and then we have to build it back up. And anyway, I kept thinking about that, those penguins that kept leaving at 10 o'clock in the morning and not coming back until late. And I thought, you know, I bet you they really are limited just like woodpeckers are limited by not having the holes that they need or um, you know, the um, uh, chickadees. I mean, you can't have chickadees in your yard unless you've got a nesting box for the chickadees. So we've been busy building nests. 
And unfortunately, the penguins are smarter than we are, and they like the high-end nests. They like lava tunnels, lava tubes, which means you got to take a crowbar and, uh, you know, bash it into the lava and dig out a hole. And then they, they'd like to be in there, you know, like maybe a half a meter. It's a lot of work to build these nests, and I wanted to just build carports. You know, take some lava, put the lid on top and have them breathe there. They don't really like those. They want lava tunnels and tubes. So we've been busy building them lava tubes and tunnels. Take it, Carol. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think in general, the I don't think we've, we've said it out loud yet that the Galapagos penguin is an endangered species. It's listed as endangered on the IUCN red list. And it's population and probably 2,500 or so. Yeah, very small population, maybe as little as half of what it was in the 70s when D was down there. And that's largely due, and I think we'll, we'll talk about El Nino later, but that's largely due to severe El Ninos that led to um, high adult mortality. And so, so they're threatened by that, but there's little that we can do day to day to stop El Ninos. So we look for other sort of um, other thing, other conservation strategies to just sort of help the penguins buffer them against these strong El Nino events. So the idea with the nests is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, if they if you have a good season where there's lots of food, the penguins are fat, everyone's ready to breed. We really wanted it to be such that those every penguin that was fat and ready to ready to breed had a high quality shaded area to lay their eggs. So hoping to therefore increase their reproductive success and help increase the population that way so that they um, are more buffered against those extreme El Nino events. So uh, we have 120 nests that we've built and there we call them constructed nests because they're, they're using natural materials. We used lava um, that was there in the islands rather than bringing in artificial materials. Um, but so and they're, they're so yeah. good that even scientists that have been studying penguins have not recognized the nests that we built are artificial nests. That's been the most rewarding thing to me is to have people that should know better say, well, we found this natural nest and <laughs> say, no, we built that nest. And they say, well, how do you know? I got a map and we look at our map. Well, you didn't put big numbers on it. Don't need big numbers. We just need to know where it is and then we check it. If yeah, so, so they're, 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 yeah, some of them are, are really, um, yeah, look pretty natural. And there's 120 of them that we check each visit. And so far, I wrote these numbers down this morning, 21 of those nests have been used by penguins. So we have found eggs or chicks or mated pairs inside. 12 of those nests have been used more than once. So we've had 47 uses of the nest total, which might seem like a small number, um, but just to put that in context, that is that makes up 28% of all the active nests we have found since 2011. So on each trip, we check the constructed nest, but we also check all the natural nests that Dee found uh, throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So all the ones we know, we search for new natural nests. And once we find a new natural nest, we continue checking that nest on every trip. So on each trip, we're checking a lot of natural nests and the constructed nests. And uh, we just don't see a lot of breeding. Um, so the numbers seem low, but it is about a third of the active nests we have found are in these constructed nests, um, which is super exciting to us. Also, the fact that the penguins are reusing the nests. Um, we haven't been able to test this for Galapagos penguins, but for a lot of other bird species, you know, if, if you fail in a nest, those birds are are likely to go try a different nest the following breeding season, or they'll, you know, they'll have less fidelity to that nest site if they've failed. So the fact that the penguins are reusing these nests um, is an indicator that the nests are working for them. Um, and that's something that we're excited to, you know, continue to study and try to um, understand better. And I guess the, the last thing I wanted to say about the nests was that um, some of the nests we've built and returned six months later, and they're in use. So some of those nests, there's an immediate demand, the penguins find it and are using it. Um, some of the other nests, like our nests at Punta Espinosa on 
on Fernandina Island have taken the penguins 11 years to use, but this year was the first year that we, in July 2021, we found a pair in one of our constructed nests and we're extremely excited. We're thinking, oh my gosh, they finally found this area or this, this area of nests that we built. This is super exciting. We came back in February, 2022. That same pair was in that nest with eggs and four of the other nests nearby had um, sign of penguin in it. So one nest had a lot of guano in it, which means that they probably did breed in it. One nest had um, an egg in it, a broken egg. Another nest had a couple shots of guano. Um, and so that was really amazing to see, you know, it's, oh my gosh, it's taken 11 years, but they're, they have found them and they're using them. Um, and so that's an area we're super excited to go and check out in July, this July as well. That is just incredible. That is, you know, so exciting to be able to see not only the, the actions you're taking bring to fruition, you know, breeding attempts and, and occupancy within months, but even after decades for them to finally be moving into those spaces. I mean, it just goes to show, just like you were saying about the population dynamics and trying to understand trends, these conservation, these large scale conservation actions take time. And sometimes they take more time than you necessarily would think or hope. But 10, 11 years, I mean, that is in the grand geological scale, nothing. And so it's incredible right. that it's finally working out for y'all. And that's, and to be able to fool scientists and to please penguins alike, that's a pretty, that's a pretty successful uh, constructed nest uh, system you got going on. So that's pretty impressive stuff. Now, Caroline. It, it shows the importance of really understanding the natural history of these animals in the Galapagos because they can be so different. And certainly that's one of the things that the um, Galapagos Conservancy is trying to do with pink iguanas. I mean, you know, we have to understand natural history and we, and we haven't spent as much time on natural history. We're more interested these days in making models or in genomics. But we know that our models will completely fail if we don't have them with good natural history. So we've got to have the data and the natural history, and you can't throw that off in a year or two. Um, so that's why funding from Galapagos Conservancy has been so critical to our success and to be able to do what we have been doing for penguins. And it, it's worth mentioning uh, that generous that 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 support that we're able to give Dr. D and the and the boards in the lab and Caroline um, is only possible thanks to supporters like you at home. So again, just this is an example of of really what your donations, what your support is going to, is real, true, in practice conservation work in the field. And so it's it's just so gratifying. I know for me to be able to hear that the work that um, the support that we're giving to you all for the work that you do is is working. So I'm I'm. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Now, Caroline, you did mention this El Nino um, and kind of how these El Nino patterns are impacting Galapagos penguins. I know that a lot of species in Galapagos get really significantly affected by these El Nino patterns, but could you explain for our viewers at home just a little bit about what is an El Nino pattern and, and why does it affect penguins so significantly? Sure. So what makes the Galapagos Islands um, such a, a wonderful place for wildlife to persist, particularly the marine wildlife, is that there are there's a cold water current that gets pushed up. So the, the islands are these, you know, they're, they're volcanic islands and cold water currents move into the islands and get pushed up to the surface. The, the, the land pushes the cold water at the bottom of the of the ocean or lower down the ocean up to the surface where you get um, sunlight into that, that cold water. And that's a, a perfect combination for phytoplankton blooms. So you're getting this really nutrient rich cold water plus sunlight. Um, and that supports a lot of, a lot of wildlife so that supports um, phytoplankton blooms that supports fish and then predators all the way up the, the food chain. And what happens during El Nino is those ocean currents slow and the upwelling into the islands slows or or yeah significantly slows and so you don't get that new nutrients into the islands and productivity basically halts 
Um, and so there isn't enough food for marine animals and they'll skip breeding, they'll get very skinny. And in the severe El Ninos, the um, adults can, can starve. And that's what we've seen uh, happen for Galapagos penguins. There was a very severe El Nino in the early 80s and another one in the late 90s. And during that time, there was really mass mortality of the, of the penguins. Um, there was another El Nino in 2015 that I was able to witness with D. And it wasn't as severe as the earlier El Ninos. We don't think that there was as much of a die off of the adults, but when we were in the islands during that trip, we didn't see any active nests for that year. We didn't see any juveniles in the population. And the penguins were, Dee's about to show a picture. The penguins were in poor condition. They were extremely skinny. They had, you can see there, that's algae that is growing all over that penguin's body. And I sort of mentioned that earlier that, you know, when the penguins are spending all their time in the water looking for food, they don't spend time on land um, cleaning their feathers and drying off. And so they, they have this algae that grows on their feathers. Um, the opposite of the El Nino or the, the other side of the El Nino is the La Nina. And that's when nutrient rich water is really abundant in the islands and upwelling is very productive. And um, that's a really good time for marine life to breed. Um, and we do see increased breeding of the penguins during La Nina. So they sort of have this, um, uh, Ying and yang. Yeah, sort of boom and bust. Um, and so that's where we're hoping that during La Nina's, those nests can really help the penguins sort of recover from, from missed breeding opportunities during El Nino. And the, the fear moving forward or the concern moving forward is that severe El Ninos are becoming more frequent with climate change. Um, and so that's something that, that a lot of um, wildlife ecologists um, are, are concerned about. The, the, the impact and the moving changes of climate change puts so much into question. And I'm wondering kind of how you all are looking at the future of Galapagos penguins with that context in mind. Well, that's one of the important reasons to build good nests. I mean, one of the nests that I actually studied in you know, 1970, so more than 50 years ago, every time we've gone to Galapagos, um, we've checked that nest out, and it's been in use a lot. I mean, Carolyn first saw it, I guess, when we went in, uh, 20, she went down in 2015, and I think it was being used then. But one of the trips that we came down, um, saw two eggs, they were being incubated, they were getting close to being ready to hatch. We came back like a week later after a really unusually high tide, and both of those eggs were in that nest smashed because the high tide had come up um, and it never, I never had seen it like that in the seventies or the eighties. I mean, it, it just didn't get that high, but with some wind and a high tide, those eggs got smashed. So that's why it's important to build nests like this, a little higher tide than what, you know, it used to be. And so we want to build them a little higher, but of course the penguins like to be close to the, to the sea. Uh, we built a nest and Carol and I, like this nest a lot, <laughs> it's in Elizabeth Bay, and it's probably about oh, five centimeters <laughs> general above the highest high tide. So if we got a high tide with some wind, that nest could be really in trouble. But that's one of the nests that uh, we've had uh, pairs in, uh, breeding in more than twice. So they really liked that nest and they immediately colonized it as soon as we'd finished building it. So we know these nests are really important and the whole idea is just to give these penguins a chance. 
to buffer them. When there's food, we want everybody to be able to breathe. And of course, they have two eggs. And when there's plenty of food, they raise two chicks. So these La Nina events are gonna be key to increasing this population. And the other thing about Galapagos penguins is that people don't know, most people don't know anyway, um, is that th there's only two species of penguins that we know feed their young after they fledge. Galapagos penguins are one. And so after the check, chicks actually go to sea, the, they, the juveniles now, because once they get into the sea, we call them juveniles, those juveniles will stay right near their nest, kind of floating around looking for food. And then when they see the adults come home, boy, they're right up there begging from the adults. And if the adults have been successful, they'll feed their chicks. But if they haven't been successful, they won't feed the chicks because they gotta take care of themselves too. So they will peck their chicks and, and go away, you know, and then come back again later. But that's why when there's food available, we want everybody to be able to breed because they can be successful. And those chicks, we hope, will of course recruit into the population and they'll have a good chance because if there's lots of food, when the chicks fledge, they get a chance to practice and learn how to get fish and feed on, on uh, fish larvae and eels and other things that they eat. So it's really important to have good nesting sites so that when conditions are good, everybody that can breed will breed. And, I, and I'll just add that an, another sort of option that managers have to sort of aid the penguins as they face this changing climate are other important uh, tools that managers have are to remove invasive predators from the islands. So cats and dogs, um, will kill adult penguins, um, the invasive rats will kill chicks. Um, and so removing cats, rats, and dogs from, from the islands where they've been uh, introduced uh, would also expand just areas where the penguins can have eggs, can put their eggs safely. So expands their sort of habitat, um, viable habitat for, for breeding. So predator removal, and then also protecting the food supply as much as we can. So um, enforcing, implementing and enforcing um, marine zoning, marine no-take areas, which the park has um, implemented in the islands. And so, and that's, I think, a really important move for them and to, so to continue really enforcing the, the conservation areas um, is another and one, thing. And one of the things that our team has done is recommend new areas to the park that need to um, be protected and, and make them um, free of fishing in particular. It's, it's so interesting and, and, and positive, optimistic to hear that, you know, as you mentioned, these, these populations are small and have decreased likely since Dr. Boardman has been studying them in the 70s, um, but that to allow them to rebound and support their population viability moving forward, you simply have to set the stage for them, allow them to have adequate places to nest and to breed, allow them safety and security from introduced predators and allow them to have a consistent food supply, even when you know we're facing down the threat of more severe El Nino events and, and what climate change will bring to the islands of Galapagos and elsewhere. We still have these, these, these decisions that can be made and these actions that can be taken to, again, set the stage for a more successful penguin survivability and population viability moving forward, which I think is, is really incredible. And so speaking of moving forward, I know that you all are very busy, and you've mentioned that you have a trip, another trip planned for down in July, which is, I'm sure you all are very excited to get back on Ratty and get back out there. Um, but I'm just curious, I mean, from publishing a, an informational booklet, which I know Dr. Borsman might have on hand that she was kind of mentioning earlier, um, planning trips to multiple islands, including, as you've kind of referenced, the Floriana um, program you guys are starting to work on pretty heavily, and then just general keeping up with your population numbers and penguins. What's next for the two of you coming up at the end of 2022 and then, and then further down the road? I want to say I want people to take advantage of what we've done. So um, there's this uh, book called uh, Penguins Natural History and Conservation that uh, Popey Berberoglu and I edited, um, came out in 2013. I think you can still get it on Amazon. It's um, published by the University of Washington Press. Um, but there's a whole chapter on uh, Galapagos penguins 
and great pictures. This, this I, I tell Carolyn this regularly, if you wanna write a bestseller, and I've always wanted to write a bestseller, this turned out to be a bestseller. You just gotta get a very small press. So University <laughs> of Washington Press, this became their bestseller for uh, 2013, but it's got a whole chapter on Galapagos penguins, Magellanic penguins, all of the 18 species of penguins, great pictures, um, and it tells you more than you probably want to know. But our recent um, book that is uh, now becoming available, in the, and it's going to be um, placed on the um, Galapagos National Park um, website, but this book, um, it's, it's, not, it's not big or long or anything, but we wanted people to know about Galapagos penguins. And it's got some great pictures. This is a juvenile Galapagos penguin on the cover. So that's why it looks different from most black and white penguins that you've seen, because that's a juvenile. But it talks about El Nino in this book and it's all in Spanish. So it shows you the reproductive cycle and things like that. And that's going to be available online, both in English, which we're finishing the translation. Godfrey's um, finishing that now in the islands. So that's the next big thing, is to have this book available both in English and Spanish, and it written at a level that you know, young adults can understand as well as old adults. And we're working with the uh, with Galapagos National Park to distribute those books to all the schools and libraries in Galapagos. So we're hoping to make that a resource um, for for teachers in the islands. Um, also, that the first book that Dee mentioned, the larger book from 2013, that book is also available in Spanish. Um, if anyone is interested, that translation came out in 2015. Um, but yeah, so finishing and now, it's coming out in Japanese. <laughs> so around the globe <laughs> and you see it's got a gentoo penguin on the cover so another species of penguin um, you can see there are nice pink feet and then it's got a picture of the biggest uh, or one of the biggest uh, species of uh, penguins these king penguins that are found on particularly South Georgia islands Yeah, so that's an exciting thing we're working on, um, hoping to have, yeah, we're sort of, we're working with a designer in Galapagos now to, to fit the translated text in with the photos now that the translation is, you know, a different length than the, the original. Um, we're excited if for the- you go to the Center for Ecosystem Sentinels.org, you can sign up for um, a newsletter. We put a newsletter out uh, twice a year, and that usually- uh, tells a bit more about what we're doing in the Galapagos as well, well as what we've been doing in Argentina. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think the July trip, we're excited for that. The their, the conditions in, in Galapagos now are La Nina-esque, and those are predicted to uh, continue possibly through the summer. And so um, to get to go in July and get uh, more data from a from a La Nina trip or a, a trip when conditions are, are good for the penguins, that's um, that's going to be really important data to have that we're excited about. Um, yeah, and then just working on you know we're again like we're finally feeling like we are have the data to start working on these the papers about the the nesting of the penguins and their population. Um, and so yeah, getting to sort of analysis and writing this year is a yeah. Caroline's been writing a lot because she'll be defending her dissertation, and part of it will be on Magellanic penguins, and part of it will be on Galapagos penguins, and that is going to happen in May, so stay tuned. <laughs> That's right, folks. Stay tuned at home, and, and, be, and you can be sure to know that whenever these publications finally go live, we will let you know so that you can get your hands on them and learn just as aside, alongside the rest of us as we continue to discover more about Galapagos penguins. Now, we are running out of time pretty soon. I know we have a couple of audience questions, so is it okay if we go to a couple of those real quick? Great. So this one is, this is a classic. I'm sure you, you all get asked this one a lot, but this is from um, Michael Darrell. What is the best place in Galapagos for visitors to see Galapagos penguins? I'd send you to Bartolome um, because it's a pretty, easy day trip. 
um, and you get to swim with Galapagos penguins. I mean, there's not a lot of them there, um, probably about 30 in the general area, but almost every day, there's at least a couple of uh, Galapagos penguins and they haul out uh, around the pinnacles. And so you really get to see Galapagos penguins there. That's probably the easiest place. But you, you can see them on Isabella. You just can't see them very often on Santa Cruz. Maybe once every five, seven years, <laughs> a penguin will show up there. Um, a few years ago, one penguin showed up on Genovesa, a juvenile. Um, but, you know, you've really, you got to go to Bartolome or to Elizabeth Bay or Tagus Cove or Fernandina um, to Punta Espinosa to see Galapagos penguins. Gotcha. And, and just to be sure, you aren't renting out any space on the deck of the Ratti for, for camping or anything like that? We've, we've had a lot of inquiries, but once they find out that they don't get a bed and that they got to compete for the deck space and that we think that we have first dibs on the deck space, um, they usually disappear. <laughs> also, the cold, the bucket of um, ocean water shower is uh, can also be a deterrent. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Well, sorry, Michael, uh, we tried. Um, next up, this is a question from uh, Robert Rothman. Um, and you kind of spoke on this earlier, Dr. Borden, so I'm curious if you have any um, expansion on it. But has there been any genetic analysis performed on Galapagos penguins? And is there any significant differences between them and other species? Yes. Um, Elaine Askey um, did her PhD in part on that um, at the University of Maryland. And, um, I collected samples for her and she analyzed them. Um, but there's not a lot of uh, genetic differences. Uh, there are uh, different alleles for the uh, penguins on Floriana compared to uh, Fernandina or Isabella. Um, there's always more room to be done on genetics and all of these uh, sort of uh, interesting um, aspects as these populations expand or contract. Um, Galapagos penguins, the genetics certainly shows that they've come through some bottlenecks, as you would expect with a small population that probably started from a very few number of individuals. So lifetimes of genetic work, whether it's on Galapagos penguins or any of the other 18 species. Awesome. All right, I'm going to combine the last question into two questions. So this is from David and Chindia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And Elisa Campbell. So David's question is, what are the main prey species of penguins? And can you kind of keep track of those food sources over time, which you kind of already spoke about? And then Elisa's question or Eliza's question is, are there any native predators of Galapagos penguins that live in the archipelago? I'll just take the first part of that. Penguins will eat anything that's smaller, pretty much smaller than their head. So um, Galapagos penguins eat eels, they eat uh, fish, they have a hard time eating a lot of these reef fish because they're a little too big. And at least when they try to get something that's uh, too big, often they lose it to a Galapagos sea lion that comes by or even a pelican. Um, there are lots of things that are busy trying to eat small fish. Galapagos penguins are extremely successful at eating small fish. As you've seen from the picture, they've got a really long beak. These are, um, they've got more beak than anything else. But interestingly enough, the beak is about the same size as a Magellanic penguin. And a Magellanic penguin is twice the size of a Galapagos penguin. So Galapagos penguins got a lot of beak and they will eat anything from very small crustaceans, um, krill, um, like they do in the Antarctic, there's krill in the Galapagos, um, any kind of crustaceans, fish, all of those um, are on their dinner menu. Yeah, and then in terms of, of predators, um, it's hard to witness a, a predator event because it's happening largely in the water, but um, you know, we'll certainly capture penguins that have uh, yes, that was an amazing experience. We saw a Galapagos hawk eating a juvenile penguin. That's it, sort of standing on the penguin there. Um, 
they will often catch penguins that have shark sort of bite marks in them, though Dee has mentioned that, that she saw that a lot more in the 70s, so it's possible that with a decline in sharks, there are fewer sharks that are um, going after the penguins, but that's that's a natural predator. There are native rats on um, in the Galapagos called rice rats, and I, they will eat uh, penguin eggs or chicks if given the chance. Um, so yeah, there certainly are, are native um, predators. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking those questions from the audience. Um, again, if there were any questions that we didn't get to, ecosystemsentinels.org, I'm sure it can answer all of those and more, answer all of your dying, burning questions about Galapagos penguins and other penguins that the Ecosystem Sentinels team works with. Um, Dee, as you mentioned, Galapagos penguins have a long beak and it seems like a big mouth, just like me, and I know I could keep you all here all day talking about Galapagos penguins, but I know that you are both very busy, so I want to be sure to let you get back to your lives. But again, is there any Enjoy other... Enjoy World Penguin Day. It only comes once a year. Of course. Happy World Penguin Day. And maybe we'll get you all on next year so you can give us some updates. But is where else, again, let's mention it, where else can people find you and learn more about your work? You got to go to the website. <laughs> and from there, there are links. We're, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, all those links are on the website as well. So whatever social media you use, uh, we're, we're on there. You can find us there. So again, that is ecosystemsentinels.org, ecosystemsentinels.org, and then all social media, track them down as well because they're doing some really, really cool stuff. And I know that speaking for Galapagos Conservancy, we are absolutely thrilled to continue to and have worked with the Boardma Lab and the Ecosystem Sentinel team and Caroline and, and Dr. Boardma for so long and to continue to do so moving forward. Now, thank you both so much for joining us today and taking time out of your favorite day of the year to sit down with us and our viewers at home to teach us more about Galapagos penguins and, of course, the work that you are all doing to protect them. Thank you so much for thank your... Thank you so much for your support. Of course. Yeah, we really thank appreciate you. the support from the Galapagos Conservancy. Yeah, and, and, that's, um, and that is purely our supporters and our viewers at home. But it's only thanks to you all that we were able to, to support projects like this and species such as the Galapagos penguin. We're only able to do what we do, and they're only able to do that as well with the support of generous donors and supporters like you. So Dr. Borsma, Caroline, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Caroline, best of luck at your defense coming up. I can't wait to hear how it goes. Um, to the viewers at home, thank you so much for tuning in and happy World Penguin Day. This has been Field Transmissions and we will see you next time. Bye everyone.